Today, we're going to take a deep dive into solid state battery technologies, and we're truly delighted to be joined by two of the world's experts on the topic. Um, we are joined by today, Professor Linda Nazar from the University of Waterloo and by Professor Jürgen Janek from the University of Gießen. Let me take a brief opportunity to introduce them. Um, they are truly leaders in many aspects of battery technology. Linda uh, comes from the background of solid state chemistry. And for many decades, she has been studying the structure property relationship of ionic transport. And over the past 25 years, she has investigated many different types of battery chemistry, ranging from lithium sulfur batteries, lithium air batteries, lithium ion batteries in terms of cathode chemistry. She started all the way from lithium iron phosphate to all the high energy density technologies uh, that is very actively pursued today. Linda is a member of the Royal Society. She has won countless awards and mentored dozens of students and postdocs who are now doing their independent research elsewhere in the world. And I have had the pleasure of knowing Linda since when I was a graduate student and um, I'm truly um, amazed at all the contribution that she has made. And I'm delighted to hear from her today. Jürgen Janek uh, comes from the background of physical chemistry and is very well known for developing many techniques, both experimental and computational, to understand fundamental processes happening in redox materials. And in the recent 10 years, he has made significant contributions to the understanding of solid state batteries, whether there are based on sulfides or oxides, and particularly understanding the importance of interfaces within those materials. Uh, Jürgen is the Dean of Biology and Chemistry at the University of Gießen. He also run a joint industry lab with Kars at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, um, the Bella Lab. So without further ado, I would like to ask Linda to start her presentation. Good morning. Everyone, thank you, Will, for that very kind introduction. So I'll be talking about um, design rules for solid state electrolytes. And I put rules in quotation marks because they're not so much rules as perhaps strategies. And I would especially like to start off thanking all of the people in my group uh, that did all of the work that made this, that is making this possible uh, today. So, um, there's been a lot of, I'm not going to talk about solid state batteries, that's um, Jürgen Yenick's um, position, but I will just make a brief introduction to the topic. And um, this is an article taken from the Julian Spector about why Toyota's next move is solid state batteries. Of course, they, there's less risk of fire because they don't have flammable electrolytes. They also allow for fast charge times. And in particular, uh, the technology will allow one to stack cells, uh, thus automatically improving energy density by a factor of as much as two to three. And The Economist in 2017 asked if solid state batteries will power us all. There was a nice article here and they um, optimistically assumed that uh, electric cars powered by these could be on the road by 2020. Well, we're not there yet, obviously, but that's um, what happens when you're a little too optimistic. So um, solid state batteries rely on superionic conductors and optimized interfaces. And again, Jürgen is going to be talking about those interfaces. I'll be talking about the superionic conductors. So the concept is pretty simple. We have a positive electrode at some high positive potential, which is indicated here by red. We have a conductive additive, typically carbon, indicated in black. And at the negative electrode, we have the negative electrode material indicated in blue, again, with some electronic additive. And the electrolyte runs uh, completely through that cell. So the problem is, of course, um, developing good solid electrolytes, but it's also a problem of the interface, the triple phase boundary, where at the active material, for example, the positive electrode, lithium ions and electrons have to be simultaneously transported to that active material. And that requires very intimate interfaces. So while the, the reactivity of the electrolyte is not a concern, achieving the simultaneous transport is indeed a challenge. 
And if one has large secondary particle aggregates, that's also a challenge to obtain the, the, uh, an adequate interface. So uh, the, um, more specifically, there is also issues of chemical stability of the electrolyte with the positive electrolyte. There is oxidative stability issues of the electrolyte in the presence of carbon. And ultimately, one really wants to use lithium or sodium, if one is using a sodium solid state battery, if one used to, wants to use a metal, a metal anode. And this presents its own problems because, of course, um, many electrolytes are not stable with lithium metal. Really, only garnets are, are shown to be stable and, <clears throat> and still dendrites will form. And so that usually requires uh, the incorporation of some sort of protective interface. Those concepts are summarized in this slide uh, with just a little bit more detail on the challenges. So the first point is that thick composite electrodes with a high active mass are really necessary in order to compete with today's lithium ion batteries. So that implies that we have high ionic conductivity of the solid state electrolyte in the order of five to 10 millisiemens. And we have this stable interface that I mentioned and low redox activity with the additive. The electrolyte itself, the membrane, needs to have good mechan mechanical properties. And that means that ideally it is a relatively ductile material that will enable dynamic pressure control to be established. And again, these criteria for conductivity. So I won't get into these factors very much. I've already explained that lithium metal is using it as a negative is fairly crucial to really um, establish commercialization and a competitive edge for these um, batteries. And just a point that I think you're gonna discuss in great detail is the fact that one needs uniform density over that interface. And I would just ask perhaps that glasses might be the answer, but I won't have time to talk about them today. And ultimately good rate capacity and rate capability are necessary to compete. So we might ask ourselves, are these sorts of um, metrics achievable in a solid state battery comparable to that of a lithium ion? So again, the performance is limited by kinetics, not so much by transport across the interfaces, as I think Jurgen will be telling you. And of course, then we also have to consider the scalability um, of the um, of production of the solid electrolytes. So I won't be talking about polymer electrolytes today, not because they aren't um, a viable technology. They tend to have conductivities that are a little lower than what are desirable. But we work on the solid inorganic electrolytes. This is just a this, um, comparison between oxides and sulfides. And um, as you might imagine, one obtains better conductivity with a soft anion lattice, such as a sulfide, but better stability with a hard anion, hard anion lattice. So examples of oxides include garnets, perovskites, nasicon type materials. These are all relatively chemical, chemically stable, electrochemically stable at a high voltage. They're compatible, as I said, garnets with metallic lithium, but they do have this unfortunate um, rigidity, there's young, very high Young's modulus in the order of more than 150 gigapascals. And that makes them non-conformable and rather difficult to process um, into cells. Okay, so in the case of sulfides, a um, variety of different materials have been examined. These are sensitive to moisture, unlike the oxides. They have high voltage stability limits. They will react with the lithium metal oxide interface, which means that um, sort of passivating layers are required, uh, but they are relatively ductile with a low Young's modulus in the order of 18 to 25 gigapascals. And then a new player on the block are halides. And so the halides um, are also somewhat sensitive to moisture. They're encompassed by materials such as um, Li3MCL, where M tends to be a rare earth and also halo spinels, which I'll mention at the end of my talk, um, they actually are compatible with most cathode oxides, although they're not stable with metallic lithium, but they enable cathode and oxide materials to be used without a protective coating. And they also have the advantage of good ductility. And um, <clears throat> the topic of today's talk, I'll be sort of going over many of these materials, but I guess one point just to remind you that all of these um, solid state electrolytes have toy total ionic conductivities with negligible electronic conductivity. And effectively, that gives a transport number of one, uh, which is, um, offers real advantages over most liquid ion uh, liquid electrolyte systems, which will not have a transport number of anything close to one and often in a vicinity of 0.4 to 0.5. So in order to 
achieve good solid state electrolytes, then we need to have a facile conduction pathway for the mobile ions, which means a high number of carriers, a somewhat flattened energy landscape, which I'll be discussing. We need to have disorder in the mobile ion lattice and weak interactions with the framework, another topic of today's talk, and a polarizable anion sublattice, and I'll be talking about the role of anion dynamics. And in fact, I'll pretty much start my talk with that. So the first superionic sulfide arguably is lithium germanium biophosphate. This was reported by Rio Giocano in 2011, and it really opened up the field. So this is often quaintly known as LGPS because of its formulation. And it's reported to have ion conductivity in the order of uh, 12 millisiemens at room temperature. And so this makes that conductivity comparable to trad traditional liquid organic electrolytes. And the solid electrolytes are not affected by viscosity at low temperature, which gives them um, good low temperature um, performance, at least comparable to liquid electrolytes, if not better. So this is just a diagram from um, a recent paper by Rio Giocano and Toyota in Nature Energy in 2016. 16, and this is what we call a Rigoni plot of power versus energy. And it compares all solid state batteries with a lot of other different technologies, lithium sulfur, magnesium, lithium air, um, conventional lithium ion batteries. And you can see that the solid state batteries perform re really rather well under these, um, in this plot. Uh, especially at high temperature, but even um, under room temperature conditions, they show advantages in both terms of power and energy. So this is what's um, promoting all of the excitement in this area. So a few years ago, when we started uh, looking at these materials, we started working on some sodium ion batteries, and we were aiming to find a sodium analog to LGPS. And we discovered this material, which is not isostructural to, I to LGPS, but it actually serves as an excellent model and I'll be using it as a framework to talk about anion dynamics. So its formulation is Na11SN2PS12. So you see the similarity in composition with the um, LGPS, but as I said, it's a new crystal family. And it has both, it has ordered PS4 and SN4 tetrahedra shown here in teal and in cobalt blue. And it has channels which contain different sodium ions. There's actually six sodium ions the six sodium ion sites in this material. And these form channels that run along the uh, C axis and also along the A and the B axis. So it's a three dimensionally conductive material. You can see that these channels are formed by face shearing octahedra of the sodium that run in all of those three directions. And here's a better depiction of that along the A axis where you can see that this is the, the window, the triangular window with which, through which the sodium ions pass. There's also an additional site, which we call the sodium-6 site, which is a cubic site. Um, it's not so important. So the point here is that the sodium-1 and sodium-2 positions are partly occupied. These are the ones depicted in sort of a light rose color, whereas the other three sodium sites in the lattice are about 95% occupied. So we have a occupied, partially occupied, occupied, partially occupied, alternating type of system or uh, arrangement, motif in the lattice, which um, gives rise to good conductivity in part because we don't, there's, uh, we lower the energy for defect formation because of these partial vacancies. The structure is reported by us in EES in 2018 and um, at about the same time, or just very shortly thereafter, by um, Sophie, uh, Stephanie Damon and Bernard Rowling's group. So we carried out AMID, uh, ab initio molecular dynamics studies, uh, to understand sodium transport in this material. And you can see this is the sodium ion probability density. You can see that um, there's isotropic conduction, as shown by this probability density in all three dimensions. And you can furthermore see that the experimental conductivity of 1.4 millisiemens um, is in rather very good agreement with that predicted by the AMID theory, which is 2.4 millisiemens. And similarly, the activation energy by theory of 0.2 electron volts is very similar to what we obtain, which is about 0.24 electron volts uh, from experiment. So this is, as I said, a three-dimensional superionic conductor, and um, the diffusion coefficient that we obtain from AMID is about two times 10 to the minus eight centimeters squared per second at 300 Kelvin in all three, three crystallographic directions. And that makes it somewhat similar, or very similar, I should say, to LGPS, but um, just in the uh, LGPS in the, uh, the basal plane. 
So one of the, um, as we started to look for other analogs to this system, one of the materials we discovered was the um, antimony analog, which is shown here. It was reported in chemistry materials about the same time. And we expected this to have better conductivity because of its larger cell volume, uh, smaller, because of its larger cell volume, I have those numbers switched, um, compared to the phosphorus. So this actually, this has the, um, the smaller cell volume, this has the larger cell volume, so you have to switch those numbers. So the point here is that the conductivity is about half that of the phosphorus analog, and the activation energy is much higher than that of the phosphorus analog. And this is also borne out by our theoretical calculations, where you can see that the, either the sulfide or the selenide have a lower activation energy of about 0.25 compared to that of the, of the antimony analog. And uh, the reason for this is actually shown in this, uh, these maps. So this is, these are maps obtained from neutron diffraction data. These are called, uh, this is derived from the maximum entropy method, often abbreviated as MEM. And so this is effectively a map of the nuclear density. It's obtained from extracting the structure factors from the neutron diffraction data itself. And so what you see here for the uh, phosphorus analog is the nuclear density for, for example, the, for the sulfur around the PS4 group. So this is the red blobs here are the sodium ion density in the structure. And this green density at 300 K shows the rotational motion of the PS4 group about this phosphorus position. And you can see that at three Kelvin, there is even disorder obtained in that PS4 group, whereas at 300 K, that is rapidly rotationally disordered. And this is also true, um, of course, at 450 K. So we see this rotation at 300, whereas in the antimony analog, there is no motion whatsoever at 3 degrees Kelvin, at 3 Kelvin, whereas at 300 K, there is only some disorder, but not um, actual rotation. So, there's a, so this provides, um, this is a real contrast between these materials, which we wanted to look into in greater detail. And that's shown on the next slide. And uh, it relates to this long, this concept, which was developed um, actually long ago and has been recently revisited, uh, which is sometimes called the paddle wheel effect. And we actually prefer to an, uh, make an, al an analog more to a revolving door in which the motion of the framework is actually aiding the mobility of the cations just as one um, passes through a revolving door. So just to put things in context, the rotation of these anion tetrahedral moieties and polyanion materials in, for example, sulfates or phosphates was implicated in high temperature rotor phases. Uh, these individuals, Martin Jansen in particular, did a lot of work in this, Lundqvist as well. So they were implicated in high temperature plastic phase of the sodium phosphate at 600 and in lithium sulfate and quasi-electron um, neutron scattering confirmed this reorientational motion at 600K um, in work uh, reported by Jensen et al. And more recently, other um, using AMID and other complicated, um, sophisticated techniques, I should say, have looked at other polyanions such as the um, clozoboranes and also the borohydride Na3OBH4. Uh, so these are fairly recent reports. But um, there's, it's hard to get direct proof uh, for this coupling between the anion motion and the cation motion. And uh, that's um, what I'll be talking about a little bit more today. So our AM, so coupled with the MEMS, which I already showed you, this is the rotation of this PS4 group. So coupled with the MEMS, we did these, we carried out these AMID simulations at a variety of different temperatures and we're actually able to see the um, onset of this paddle wheel effect. So this is just a snapshot, a one picosecond snapshot that shows that as this polyanion is rotating, the sodium is moving from one position to another in the lattice. And uh, so these two processes are coupled. If one pauses or one um, artificially pauses the motion, the activation energy for that transport, the energy barrier goes up, increases to 0.36 electron volts, whereas without constraints, um, it is significantly lower of about 0.2 electron volts. Now this is um, a little bit of an artificial um, imposition upon the, the um, calculation, but still it, it, it shows the point of, um, 
of the importance of the polyanion rotation to enabling, to lowering that activation barrier for transport. And the reason for why that activation barrier is lowered is um, observed when one actually looks at the structure. This again is the, in the, the picture that I showed you before of, of the transport along these one dimensional chains. And the point is that as this polyanion, in this case the PS4, rotates, because it is edge bonded to these sodium octahedra in the lattice, it literally turns and opens up that window for transport in a transient way. So shown here is the antimony in um, blue and the phosphorus in pink. And you can see that that window opens up as the polyanion rotates for the phosphorus compound, but it does not open up for the antimony because there is no polyanion rotation. So the window remains effectively closed for the antimony where it opens up in the case of the phosphorus. And this is what we, this is a large, in large part, what gives rise to the difference in the activation energy. And so one can summarize this by saying that the anion rotation flattens the energy landscape for the cation transport uh, through the structure. And um, as I said, uh, lowers that barrier. We have also looked at this effect in lithium ion conductors. Specifically, we've compared beta Li3 PS4, which is a superionic conductor, but only at 200 degrees because the room temperature phase, which is the gamma form, um, is a very, very poor conductor. So it undergoes a phase transition at around 200 degrees um, or 250 in order to get to the, to the beta form. We've been able to stabilize a version of this structure at room temperature, which has an equivalent roughly one millisiemen per centimeter conductivity. We, this is um, obtained by incorporating lithium and, uh, into the structure and adding silicon to replace some of the phosphorus. So we're adding lithium and silicon into this lattice. And that has the effect of effectively of splitting the lithium site and so the lithium sites in the beta Li3 PS4 structure, each lithium site splits into two different sites. And that is equivalent to effectively increasing the atomic displacement parameter um, by a large factor. So all of the lithium sites are split by one angstrom, which is equivalent to effectively increasing the atomic displacement parameter. And this increases the lattice considerably, uh, the lattice volume. And it stabilizes this effectively beta Li3 PS4 type structure. So this is an entropically stabilized lattice um, with a geometrically frustrated landscape. And you can see the in the gamma form, which is of Li3 PS4, which is a very, very poor conductor, 10 to the minus seven Siemens per centimeter room temperature. There is a, the MEMS map here show that there is absolutely no rotation whatsoever. Whereas you can see that rotation in the high temperature, the so-called beta phase, um, at 200, this data was actually collected at 350, but you can definitely see the onset of that rotation. And if you compare that with the silicon substituted form, you can see the rotation is very evident in this silicon phase at room temperature, which is also has about a one millisiemen conductivity at, at 30 degrees centigrade. So it is a similar effect to what I just described with the sodium. Um, we again have a transient opening up of this triangular window, which is where the lithium ions pass in this structure. And so when we pause the rotation, the window disappears or uh, diminishes when we let the polyanion rotate. This is uh, through AMID calculations, uh, the window opens up. And this is what lowers the activation energy barrier. And um, we notice in the power spectrum that we see the same frequency range for that rotation, for the rotation of the polyanion groups, as we see for the um, lithium um, in the in the material, so so that that again is evidence for the coupled mobility and the two-dimensional probability distribution of this phosphorus to sulfur to lithium angle, and the distance between the sulfur and lithium atoms in the first shell also shows the same sort of effect. Effectively, that shows that the um, groups are highly delocalized, which signifies a strong correlation between the polyanion and the cation. If there was no correlation between polyanion mobility or rotation and the lithium, we would simply see this de uh, localized in a discrete spot. So the fact that this is delocalized is evidence of this, um, this delocalized, of this correlation. 
So time is moving on. I will switch to uh, flattening the energy landscape. This is just a picture of a golf course pointing out that we don't want to get into these little energy traps or these sand traps. And I'll talk about the agiridite lattice. Um, in this material, it is um, this or this material. This is a diagram from Wolfgang Zier's paper. You can see the polyanion tetrahedra, the PS4 groups in this structure with these Frank Casper tetrahedra in which the lithium ions um, reside in all four corners of the um, cubic structure. And these uh, Frank Casper polyhedra have um, usually two different lithium sites called a 24G and 48H site. This is the 24th um, G site here, the 48H sites are here. And um, this material is quite popular because it forms a passivating quasi stable interface with lithium metal because these insulating materials form and are not and do not continually grow. Uh, this is shown by Jurgen Yannick in a nice paper. And um, he's going to be talking about that a bit more. And uh, this has also been, there's also been anion dynamics, which have um, been investigating, which have investigated polyanion rotation. So <clears throat> there is an intercage jump in this material, which is thought to dominate long range transport. So disorder on either of these two sites will determine the ion conductivity. And if that, if we have iodine in the lattice, though the iodine is localized on the 4A site, whereas sulfur is on the 4C site, whereas in the case of chlorine and bromine, there's delocalization over those two sites, and that gives rise to very high conductivity. So my grad student, Lai Dong Zhou, uh, discovered that we could make highly conductive iodides using the antimonide version of this material, and these have conductivity upwards of 10 millisiemens per centimeter. This shows the diffraction patterns of the um, antimony, the germanium and the tin, analog, the silicon, germanium and tin analogs, and the superionic conductivity is shown here as high as almost 15 millisiemens for this particular composition. And so the point is that when we substitute antimony with the smallest um, aleovalent dopant, which is silicon, that gives rise to the highest lithium content, as you can see here, and that then gives rise to the highest conductivity. And grain boundary effects uh, are important. Uh, this just shows some impedance data where we can separate the bulk from the grain boundary. So in fact, there is relatively considerably, or there is con um, considerable grain boundary um, effects. Um, in other words, there's low conductivity, especially when we get to higher values of, of silicon. But at these conditions, we can, by sintering the pellets, we can get conductivity upwards of 24 millisiemens per centimeter. So improving the grain boundary contact certainly increases the ionic conductivity, but the bulk is excellent. And this is achieved with a very low degree of anion disorder between the sulfide and the iodine. So comparing the structures of the uh, the pristine agiridite with our silicon and lithium substituted material, we see that we have four sites in the case of this new um, silicon substituted material, where only two sites in the pristine material, and these are indicated by these arrows. And we, again, this is achieved with very little anion disorder. So the, the um, reason for this increase in conductivity is that we have these additional sites which lie between these Frank Casper polyhedra, these are the cages that are shown here. And so whether, whereas we would normally have these um, jumps within the Frank Casper polyhedra and also some intercage jumps, the addition of these new sites through a phase sharing tetrahedra, it's a little hard to see, um, enable this initial pathway. And so this allows a concerted ion migration path to take place because we populated effectively these high energy interstitial sites. And this activates a concerted ion migration, which was reported by Yifei Mo, also by Garrett Cedar, and lowers this activation energy for lithium ion diffusion. So we've also looked uh, just briefly at um, symmetric cells uh, of this electrolyte together with, with lithium. And we were able to achieve current densities upwards of 0.6 milliamps per square centimeter over as much as a thousand cycles. So this again indicates we have a quasi-stable interface formed between this agurodite iodide and the lithium, likely due to the formation of lithium iodide and perhaps some lithium antimony phases. And Jurgen Yannick will be talking more about those interfaces in the next talk. So I'll just end off on some um, halide materials. Um, also an agiridite, starting from this chloroagiridite, 
when we, the different strategy here is to increase the halide concentration in this lattice, which actually increases vacancy. So whereas in the case of the intiminides, we have a lithium rich aguridite. In this case, we have a lithium poor aguridite. Again, as I said, it creates vacancies on the lithium sites, about 10%, and it makes the material chlorine rich. And you can see that the chlorine distributes on both sites, the 4A and the 4C. So we're not really increasing the anion disorder, we're simply putting more halide into the lattice. And so the activation energy drops as we add the halide and the conductivity dramatically increases. So we are at about conductivity of about 9.4 for the highest chlorine concentration that we can achieve, which is the chlorine 1.5 phase, and that goes up to about 12 millisiemens for sintered pellets. And so this value of 12 is between the highest conductivity of the LGPS phases, uh, either this material or this material, which are reported in that Nature Energy 2016 paper that I referred to earlier. And the reason for this are um, obtained from PFG NMR measurements, where we actually quadruple the diffusivity. These are experiments done in collaboration with Jillian Goward's group at the University of at McMaster University and her grad student, David Bazak. And uh, so this is just a plot of the diffusivity obtained from these PFG measurements. And you can see that it's definitely the highest for the chlorine rich phase. And the value of diffusivity of 11 times 10 to the minus 12 is actually higher than that in LGPS uh, or in this um, lithium silicon LGPS type or, or this other type of structure. So the diffusivity is about more than threefold and that basically correlates exactly with the increase in the conductivity uh, that you see plotted here in this bar graph. So the take home message is that the anion disorder and weakened interactions between the mobile ions in the framework lead to a quadrupling in the, iron, in the ionic conductivity. And when we examine this material, um, when we examine this material um, by using CV, we could see that there was much less current passed for the chlorine rich versus the pristine agurudite material. Uh, especially after this is the first cycle and this is the second cycle. So you can see that we're forming a passivating layer and we have better anodic stability with, uh, due to this higher halide content. And so that inspired us to look at pure halide materials. And so I remind you of this plot of um, energy here where our redox potential that we're really trying to stabilize materials at these higher potentials. Halides are not typically stable with lithium metal. But you can see that in the CV that we now have an onset of oxidation that is about 4.3 at least volts versus the roughly 2.5 to 2.7, which is seen for a typical phosphate. So this enables us to obtain coating-free cathode solid state batteries and with development of a new lithium metal halide structure. So I will skip over this slide just in the interest of time. The point is that we're trying to develop not only solid electrolytes, but also coating materials, which can have advantages over things such as lithium niobate, which are difficult um, to control the quality of as one puts coatings um, on cathode materials. So lithium metal chlorides are a relatively new player in the field. They were actually investigated in 1997, 1992. Um, and Andy Sun came up with some nice work on the lithium indium chlorides at about the same time that we published work and, um, sorry, there is a Panasonic paper here cited in advanced materials. Um, and, but in this work, we've, we've substituted zirconium uh, into either the yttrium or erbium structure to obtain conductivities upwards of uh, a milli semen per centimeter. So these materials, uh, this just shows that they're basically isostructural in the case of yttrium and erbium. This shows um, X equals zero, in other words, the pure yttrium. This shows the zirconium substitution. And you can see that there's a change in phase as we add the uh, zirconium to this lattice. And that is concurrent with an increase in the conductivity up to about 1.4 millisiemens at the highest levels of X of about 0.4 to 0.5, in other words, zirconium concentration. And these uh, are accompanied by a very low electronic con con uh, conductivity of in the order of 10 to the minus 10. And this data is effectively replicated for the, for the erbium material. So um, this is a new structure. And this just shows the lithium ion conduction pathway. So we create a tetrahedral lithium ion site 
in this lattice shown by lithium-3, as opposed to the pristine material, which just has lithium-1 and lithium-2. And so the pathway here is shown in these red arrows. It's effectively a one-dimensional conductor, but there is limited conduction in, in the other planes. And so this is a bond valence energy landscape map, uh, our energy plot, and you can see this lowered energy barrier for, act for conduction compared to that between lithium-1 and lithium-2, which is upwards of 0.6. So this lower energy pathway is what enables its conductivity of about one, more than one millisiemen uh, to be obtained. And um, we then um, looked at this material with lithium cobalt oxide as a positive electrode. This shows the data for the erbium and for the yttrium. And you can see that, especially in the case of the yttrium, we're able to obtain rather um, good performance, electrochemical performance, with as little as 15% of the electrolyte. And especially, you can see that in the impedance data, the EIS, we have reduced charge transfer for the halide compared to a solid electrolyte where we're using just lithium phosphate, and that's less than uh, 1 over 20th. So that's really, we've really decreased that interfacial impedance dramatically in the cell. I might add that what we're comparing here is the cobalt oxide with either the halide in the cathode or the lithium cobalt oxide with the lithium Li3PS4 in the cathode. In both cases, we're just using Li3PS4 as the, as the membrane in the cell. So at rates of a 0.5 C and 4.3 volt window, we're able to obtain stable cycling capacity. And we since translated this to a new lithium disordered halo spinel, which is, I think, the first in its class. The structure is shown here on the left. Again, conductivities of the order of 1.5 millisiemens, activation energy similar about 0.3. And this shows the data for NMC622 and for a high nickel NMC material, uh, NMC85 concentration of nickel. And in this case, we can actually cycle all the way up to 4.6 volts with reasonable stability over 70 cycles. In the case of the high nickel material, we're, obtained, we're able to obtain capacities upwards of about 200 milliamp hours per gram, again, over roughly um, uh, 70 cycles. And this is in the wind window up to 4.5 volts. So we're, it, even though these electrolytes have a thermodynamic stability window that seems to be about 4.3, clearly there's some kinetic stabilization that enables to take us up to 4.5 or 4.6 volts. So with that, and two minutes left to go in my 35 minutes, I'll just um, briefly summarize by saying that we have some new descriptors established. We have, I would remind the audience of the need for high ionic conductivity to obtain high current densities. The issue with lithium metal does need to be addressed. And I've highlighted all of these points, increasing the vacancy population, uh, strategies to increase conductivity and stabilize interfaces, for example, with halide materials, controlling cation disorder, and anion disorder, the importance of anion dynamics, and polyanion rotation, which can enhance the conductivity by a factor of two. And um, one solid electrolyte um, is unlikely going to overcome all of these um, challenges and so bifunctional or dual electrolytes are probably necessary. So with that I'd like to again thank all of the people that did the work. Um, I'm just doing the talk <laughs> and I'd also like to thank people at ONRL who helped us who got us helped us get neutron diffraction data, our colleagues at BASF, my entire lab group shown here and uh, BASF and Jay Caesar in particular for their funding and thank you for your attention. Linda, thank you so much for that deep dive into ionic conduction and solid electrolytes. And we have received more questions than we can possibly answer in the short amount of time. So as uh, the moderator, I have the difficult task of picking out the question for you. So forgive me if I pick out um, two difficult questions. So let me start with a very high level question. Um, one of our viewers is asking, what has been the success in predicting new solid electrolyte via simulations? You show some really beautiful work of ab initial MD for understanding transport, but could you comment on how that has um, led to discoveries of electrolyte? Well, that is a very difficult question, uh, Will. And um, I would say that there's a lot of hope for the predictive capability of simulations, but at this point, they have generally proven 
more as a guideline to interesting materials that may be superionic conductors that turn out maybe not to be has they don't have as quite the conductivity that the simulations predict but it does give us um you know kind of a guideline in, in our in a an approach a strategy or target materials to target even though sometimes as i said the conductivity is not quite what was anticipated thank you linda and the next set of questions concern the first part of your talk on the rotation uh, and hopping coupling. Uh, so the first question is, can you expand upon the role of rotation on phase stability relative to ionic conductivity? I, I think you showed a, a quick two figures on this. So the question is on the role of uh, rotation to phase stability. Um, that's a harder, that, well, if we um, that's a very difficult question um, because we don't really. I would say that that answer is not clear. In the case of the, um, there are LGPS does not under seem to undergo any polyanion rotation, and yet it's a relatively stable material. Um, in the case of the lithium and silicon substituted beta Li three PS four, we stabilize that rotor phase down to room temperature, but that's really an entropic stabilization in large part because of the uh, because of the fact that we have uh, the the silicon and phosphorus in the lattice. But because we are sampling different um, rotational states of the poly anion, and we can see that in the phonon modes, there is probably a contribution of that rotation to the overall stability. So I would say that there is probably a contribution, but it is not completely quantified, or it is not well quantified. Thank you, Linda. Uh, and on a related question, um, in terms of the rotation dynamics, can you comment on its contribution to the temperature dependence, and um, specifically, how does that um, contribute to the activation energy in terms of both um, the rotation and the hopping? So you're asking if the rotation, the rotational dynamics contribute to the temperature dependence. Um, effectively, as things rotate faster, does that, does that help, does that aid the conduction? Um, We have not yet quantified, and we would be doing this with AMID, so we have not quantified the, the rotational speed, so to speak, with the effect of the cation diffusion. So experimentally, of course, conductivity is going to go up as a function of temperature. But I think what that question is really addressing is, is whether or not we have quantified this by AMID, and the answer is we have not. Okay, I'm being told we are almost running out of time, but I will squeeze in one last question. Um, your talks uh, discuss a lot of the dynamics uh, in terms of the hopping contribution um, and um, to, to the conductivity, but can you also talk about um, the effect of carrier concentration? So in terms of the amount of disorder and what type of uh, dependence do you see of the ionic conductivity on the amount of disorder in the standard ionic conduction picture? Well, of course, carrier concentration is extremely important. Um, if only portion of the lattice is involved in that conductivity, then uh, <laughs> in, in the conduction me mechanism, um, you, you don't end up with a very good conductor. So the whole, the whole approach of disordering lions in the lattice um, over many different sites, for example, in the antimony agiridite is to do just that, to increase the carrier concentration so we invoke a larger number of participatory ions in the process. And in the case of the halides, we actually see a situation where, again, uh, we, in, by increasing that, by generating new sites for lithium population and invoking those ions in the pathway, we increase the carrier concentration, even though in that case, some of the lithium ions are, are immobile and they just form a, a, an immobile framework. So the short story is really important. Thank you, Linda. And for our viewers, um, the many who we could not address the questions, we apologize, but I'm sure Linda will be happy to answer your questions by email if you reach out to her. 
So Linda, thank you once more for the deep dive into the solid state chemistry of ionic conductor, um, a, a crucial part of enabling solid state batteries. Here at Stanford, we are very concerned about all aspects of technology translation uh, being in Silicon Valley. So I would like to ask the first question on translation and the second question on policy. I know this is a bit different than the technology uh, focus of today's talk in the material science and chemistry. So my first question to the both of you is about the cost learning curve. So we know that um, the cost of solid state battery is not known today. It is uh, difficult to estimate. But if you, I can ask you to assume sometime into the future, uh, commercial activities are um, becoming more mature, commercial products are delivered. How do you think solid state battery can compete with the cost learning that is in the incumbent technology in lithium ion batteries? So as the costs begin to fall for solid state battery, so does lithium ion battery. And that is a very severe and rapid mm -hmm. cost learning curve. And um, you know, there is a cost floor for lithium ion battery, but there's still considerable room. So I was wondering if the both of you can talk about for technology like solid state or maybe other energy technology, how do we compete with another technology that is incumbent, that's a $50 billion industry uh, that is also learning at the same time? Mm. Well, I think this is the same as probably in all other technology fields. I think uh, new uh, new solutions always have, I think, have difficulties in competing with the existing ones, of course. So we see currently the fight of the electric vehicle with the auto, mo auto motor, which is uh, more than 100 years in operation uh, and is being further uh, improved. Um, so I think, in fact, I think once the solid state battery will not have substantial advantages. It will be difficult, I think, really, to uh, have in, 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 in sufficient time the sufficiently steep learn, learning curve to, uh, uh, to be also economically competitive. Um, I think in the current, uh, at least, materials uh, um, cost of, of batteries, the cathode is the most expensive part. And the electrolyte may, is, is only, so to say, taking a small share of the cost. If a solid electrolyte would change that picture too much, then this is already a significant disadvantage. So the solid electrolyte should not be really more expensive, which, uh, yeah, so uh, I think this, this is an important point. So, and uh, I think in the, in the FESPAT cluster in Germany, uh, the cost issue is in fact something we, we also deal with. We try to understand, in fact, uh, the cost issue. Well, um, I'm not an uh, uh, I'm not a specialist in techno economics, uh, um, so probably I'm not the best to answer these things. I try to find good solutions and try to understand which route one can go. Uh, but as I said, uh, it's not I would say it's not a simple automatic route for the solid state battery. But we are really in an early state, and of course industry is always impatient. I would say, but. Um, we still need some time, but we should, of course, in order, uh, I think, to understand economic potential success, we should not forget the cost, of the, uh, say, cost issues, yes. Uh, and I'm happy if people make solid, I would say, techno-economic uh, uh, models that are reasonable. But upscaling changes things. So, for example, I remember that the, the solid power guys, uh, and I, I really like their work, uh, uh, in the US uh, uh, in um, last year on a conference, they were worried about the price of lithium sulfide because that is, uh, uh, an, was an important part of the cost of, of preparing thiophosphate. And a recent conference that was not anymore changed, was not anymore mentioned. So that must simply means there must have been now, or there must be a cheap source of lithium sulfide, which before that was just a fine chemical. So with upscaling, often things change, and that has to be taken into account. And um, uh, this is my comment. Maybe Linda has uh, another uh, view on that. I think you've um, <clears throat> described it pretty well, Yuri. And I think my view would be that the, the rate of drop in the cost for traditional lithium ion batteries is slowing to some degree, whereas it's when that rate of change, the, the drop, it's, in other words, 
the rate of the drop is going to be much higher for solid state batteries. And at some point, one assumes or one hopes that they may cross over because there's so much more to be learned in solid state batteries. And indeed, um, upscaling of the solid electrolytes is very important. And I think we're not at the stage yet of even having defined the ideal solid state electrolyte. So I, I see that coming down, that the, the drop in costs, especially with processing costs coming down very rapidly, whereas I think we're, we're coming down in lithium ion, but at a much more gentle level now, sort of scaling out. So I think that would be my only additional comment to what you're going to say. Linda and Jürgen, thank you for painting this cautiously optimistic picture, of course, um, highlighting the role of chemistry uh, behind all that. Um, in the few remaining minutes, I thought I would turn your attention to the policy side of things. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure there is not a single participant here uh, and, and our viewers uh, that are free from the pandemic. And uh, we have seen some very encouraging and exciting reports where the response to the pandemic is also being coupled uh, to the response to issues of energy and sustainability. Uh, the European Union, for example, has announced major initiatives in this area, as many other countries. Uh, I was wondering if the both of you can talk about looking forward, um, what would be your recommendation to the policymakers, how the two can be coupled in a way to accelerate the recovery and also our advances uh, for clean energy? So maybe now Linda may start. <laughs> <laughs> That's because it's a more difficult question, Erin. Um, well, you know, as uh, Mark Kearney um, has said, um, you know, eventually COVID will be controlled, but climate change remains the real pandemic that's on the horizon, and um, so to speak. So um, in, in terms of in terms of establishing sustainability for the future, there is obviously no question amongst policymakers, I think, and scientists alike, that electrochemical energy storage is, is part of that solution. And that is ever going to be more um, important, whether we're in a day and age of COVID or not. I, I mean, I would say, mm. in fact, perhaps even increasingly more so, um, we're going to have to Think about obviously things are going to change at least in the short term and perhaps in the long term but in any case um, energy policy and sustainable energy policy has to be part of the solution that's um, that goes without question so um, I don't know if you're gonna have yeah. things to add yeah maybe uh, what comes to my mind is simply that yeah oh, Sorry, did I answer your question well or were you after something else no no this is great Linda thank you for sharing uh, Jürgen yeah, I think what comes to my mind is, first of all, that I think that uh, it may look that, that the COVID, uh, let's say, period uh, helps. But I think on the other hand, I think uh, at least in Europe, we have this very strong trend towards public transportation and even discussion for free public transportation to, I would say, reduce uh, individual transportation that, of course, is worth res res with respect to carbon dioxide uh, um, uh, or the carbon footprint. And uh, I think the COVID uh, period, of course, uh, is, is, uh, is a strike back because people uh, have the tendency for more individual transportation. So I think in Europe, we see maybe even in the US, we see more bikers, uh, uh, e-bikers. And uh, so I think that's, that's not very supportive. So I think uh, the trend of more public transportation, electric buses, I think is a big wave coming uh, with uh, interestingly, uh, solid state batteries entering into that with uh, polymer uh, uh, electrolytes. Um, I think it's not so simple with the COVID. It, it looks as if that ha helps to advance uh, alternative things, but partly it also leads to strike backs, I think. Jürgen, do you get a sense uh, within the, the EU that there is an injection um, of uh, funds and resources as a way yes. to restart the economy specifically for uh, technology like uh, like batteries and future technology like solid state batteries. Yeah, absolutely. This is the case. I think the, the these big programs that are currently being advanced, uh, I think uh, Europe as such, uh, so um, they had the idea really only in principle to uh, put, I would say, really substantial funds uh, into the support, I would say, of, well, environmentally benign 
technologies and things. And I think in Germany, also, I think the uh, I think there's a electric cars are being supported, and uh, there is the idea to support I think environmentally friendly. There's of course always a, a, a struggle uh, because of uh, social uh, issues uh, uh, have to be uh, con uh, considered. But by and large, I would say that there is a strong sense for that in Europe. Yes. Well, I and, think and that goes uh, that that will that will also that will definitely also I would say be trans translated into funding. Yes, I'm sure. So it sounds like there's a, a combination of push and pulls uh, as a result of the pandemic. Yes, right. um, but I think uh, we're all hopeful um, that the the two uh, can be somehow coupled between the recovery and also um, uh, progress for uh, clean technology. So we are out of time. Uh, Linda and Jürgen, I'd like to thank you once more for joining us from thank Canada, to us. Germany, yep. and uh, to entertain our uh, viewers with exciting results, uh, a six-course meal, and um, it's been really a wonderful um, journey for the past hour and a half. So thank you both very much. So just a quick announcement. Uh, we will have our next symposium. Uh, also uh, on Friday, June 12th, the same time, 7 a.m. Pacific, and uh, we will be joined by Professor Claire Gray uh, from the University of Cambridge, and also Professor uh, Gerrit Sater from uh, the University of California, Berkeley, and they will continue on uh, our excellent uh, theme so far of understanding materials and chemistry for energy storage technology. And on, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone again for participating, and we hope to uh, see you on June 12th. Thank you very much.